Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Wherever you are in the world, welcome to this special webinar presentation of the Economic Impact Assessment delivered by the OECD Secretariat. We hope you're well in these challenging times. I'm David Bradbury, the head of the OECD Centre for Tax Policy and Administration's Tax Policy and Statistics Division. And I'll be joined by a number of colleagues today and we'll be presenting some of the key findings from the Economic Impact Assessment, uh, which uh, assesses the impact of the Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 proposals to address the tax challenges of uh, the digitalization of the economy. Now, before we begin, I'd like to just share a couple of housekeeping items with you. And uh, for security reasons, the chat function uh, has been disabled. But we do encourage you to send your questions through and we, we look forward to your feedback today. Uh, please use the Q&A Zoom function. Now, for those of you that have joined us through OECD TV, uh, please email your questions through uh, to ctp.contact at oecd.org. And of course, as is the case with this webinar as with others, we will be recording the session and it will be available for uh, download and, and further viewing on the OECD website within 24 hours. Now, if we can just turn to the next slide, uh, you'll see that today I'm joined by a number of my colleagues. This is a, a project that has been a joint project of the Centre for Tax Policy and Administration and the Economics Department. And you'll be hearing from speakers who were all part of core members of the project team that have delivered this economic impact assessment. And uh, along with myself, I'm joined by Ossi Johansson, Stefan Sorb, Tibor Hanapi, Anacinta Gonzalez Cabral, Valentin Milo, Sebastian Turban, and Pierce O'Reilly. And you'll be hearing from each of these speakers throughout this presentation, uh, and they will be generally speaking to some of the elements that they've personally contributed uh, towards the, the development of, of this report. Now, if we can just move to the next slide, and just to begin by giving a little bit of context around the report itself. As you would be aware, the impact assessment report was released last Monday, the 12th of October. It was released at the same time as the blueprint reports for uh, Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. The economic impact assessment was work that was mandated by the program of work that was agreed and released in May last year. And unlike so many of the projects that we carry out uh, through the inclusive framework, this particular project uh, was not subject to the approval of the inclusive framework. Uh, this is an OECD Secretariat report released under the authority of the Secretary General and uh, has not been uh, specifically approved by the membership. The report focuses primarily on assessing the revenue and the investment effects of the two proposals, the Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 proposals. In the report, we present global results and results for jurisdiction groups. By that I mean low income, middle income, high income. We also use a category of investment hubs. But no jurisdiction specific data or results are included in this report. Now, I know that might come as a disappointment to some, uh, but after consulting closely with our uh, delegates through the inclusive framework, there was no consensus to release jurisdiction specific results and data. And on that basis, we've taken the decision uh, not to do so. Uh, but as you'll see uh, through uh, the course of this presentation and when my colleague Pierce O'Reilly speaks, he will address an important part of the engagement that we've had with country delegates in making sure that even though those jurisdiction results may not be in the report, the countries themselves are very much aware of the potential impact of various design and parameter choices on revenues in their jurisdiction. And what will become evident to you, I hope, is that we have used, a, we've really used a flexible framework in the way we've approached uh, the modelling throughout this project. Uh, the focus has been on assisting inclusive framework members, the 137 jurisdictions that comp comprise the inclusive framework. And it's been focused on helping delegates to understand what the implications might be of different decisions around the design of the, of the pillars, but also the different parameter choices and how that will impact uh, 
um, them in terms of uh, their jurisdictions, revenue impacts, but also the broader investment impacts for the global economy. And in conducting this work, we've carried it out, engaging in extensive engagement, not only with inclusive framework delegates, uh, but also with a range of other stakeholders, with the academic community, uh, and indeed, uh, we've worked very closely with international organisations and regional organisations as well. If we can just move to the next slide. It's important, I think, to begin by sharing with you some of the limitations and the caveats of the work that we've undertaken. Uh, we're, we're very proud of the work that we've carried out, but we also recognise that uh, an exercise of this nature will always be subject to some limitations and caveats. And of course, this is an ex ante assessment. It's based on a series of illustrative assumptions on the design and the parameters of the two pillars. And the results will ultimately depend on what is agreed and decided by the inclusive framework. Now, we've um, presented through the report a whole range of different options and parameters. We've modeled a whole range of those. Uh, but in order to uh, be able to present some high level results from time to time, we have to make assumptions. Uh, we've been transparent about where we make those assumptions, um, but we do that without prejudice to the decisions that are still before inclusive framework delegates uh, and will be in the period ahead. Now, the methodology relies on a number of simplifying assumptions, and uh, we will be transparent about those once again, uh, but many of those go to questions around uh, behavioural reactions and responses, uh, such as those that might be expected from multinationals or from governments. Now, in terms of the data, uh, Sebastian, um, my colleague, will also be uh, sharing some more details about the data with you later in the presentation. But I think it's worth noting that um, while there are significant limitations with the data, uh, it really does represent the best available uh, to the Secretariat. And uh, a lot of effort and work has gone in from the team to build up and to construct uh, a series of, of matrices uh, that combine various data sources in order to uh, ensure that we have the ability through this exercise to model and to produce estimates for more than 200 jurisdictions. And that's been relying upon data from a whole range of sources, including more than 27,000 multinational groups. Now, an important caveat is that the, the data is primarily 2016 and 2017. Now, um, that's the most recent available in terms of the various sources that we've drawn upon. We recognise the limitations of that. Uh, firstly, it predates some implementation of BEPS measures. It also predates the US tax reform. And of course, uh, most recently and significantly, the COVID-19 crisis. If we can just move to the next slide, um, bearing in mind all of those caveats, uh, it is important for us now to reflect upon some of the high level uh, findings and messages of the report. Now you'll see more detail of this as we progress in the presentation today. But we find that pillar one and pillar two could increase global corporate income tax revenues by about 50 to 80 billion US dollars uh, per year. Now, the combined effect of the reforms and the US guilty could represent between 60 and 100 billion US dollars per year. Well, that's around 4% of global CIT revenues. Now we find that the reforms would lead to a more favourable environment for investment and growth than would be the case in the absence of a consensus-based solution. So that's the counterfactual of not reaching agreement. And we find that in analysing the absence of a consensus, that counterfactual scenario, that there would likely be a proliferation of unilateral tax measures. The, the digital services tax and other measures that we've seen announced and threatened. And indeed, we would expect that there would be an increase in tax and trade disputes as a result of those unilateral measures. And we've estimated that the impact of those trade disputes uh, under a worst case scenario could reduce global GDP by more than 1%. Now, the COVID-19 crisis uh, to ex uh, is likely to accelerate the trend towards the digitalization of the economy uh, and to exacerbate the tax challenges arising uh, from digitalization. Um, and uh, this is something uh, that we think means that the work that the inclusive framework is currently carrying out 
is only likely to become even more significant as we move forward. Now, at this point, I'll hand over to Ossa Johansson, who will take us through uh, some of the revenue estimates at a high level. Thank you, David. So I will give an overview of the high level findings on the revenue effects of the proposal. First, I'll do it at global level and then for jurisdiction groups. So the table on this slide reports the impact of the two proposals at the global level as share of global corporate tax revenues in the middle column and in US billion dollars in the right column. And the table shows the impact of the pillars as ranges, and that is to reflect the uncertainties and the caveats the surround analysis David has just described. So the way to read this table is that the first row in the tables gives the impact of pillar one, which is estimated to lead to a modest increase in global revenues in the range of 0.2 to 0.5% of global corporate income taxes, or five to 12 billion US dollars. And as you move down in the rows in the table, it reports the revenue impact of pillar two. It reports both the direct gains from introduction of the pillar two, and also the gains from reduced profit shifting that comes about because pillar two would reduce tax rate differences across jurisdiction. And difference in tax rate is one key driver of profit shifting. So this also adds to the revenue gains of pillar two. So the combined effect of uh, pillar two is to increase global tax revenue in the range of 40 to 70 US dollars billions. And one main takeaway from this table is that the revenue gains of pillar two is greater than that of pillar one. So adding the two pillars together, the combined revenue gains is in the order of magnitude of 50 to 80 US dollar billions. So moving down in the table, the last row shows the results when assuming illustrative without prejudging the final decision of the inclusive framework that the US guilty regime would coexist with the two pillars. And in this case, the revenue gains would be around 2.3% to 4% of global corporate income taxes or some 60 to 100 US dollars billion. And it should be noted that the impact of guilty that is supported in this table is based on the ex ante assessment of the guilty regime done by the US Joint Committee of Taxation. Next slide, please. So now let me turn to the effect of revenue effect across different income groups. So this slide illustrates the key findings in, in a chart. It shows the result for three income groups, low, middle, and high income. And it also displays the results as share of corporate income taxes. So the left panel gives the impact of pillar one on tax revenues and the right hand panel the impact of pillar two. And what is clear from this chart is that all income groups gains from the proposals. And again, as Laura mentioned, the gains are greater for pillar two than pillar one across all the jurisdiction groups. So looking more detail at the impact of pillar one, so pillar one involves by design a significant change to the way patent rights are allocated among jurisdictions, and it would also lead to modest gains in revenues in most jurisdictions. And the reason for the modest revenue gain is that taxing rights shifts from lower tax to higher tax jurisdictions. Looking across income groups, pillar one would lead, to, would lead that low and middle income economies would tend to gain more revenues than high income economies. And the reason for this is that there are currently little residual profit booked in lower income economies. So they will see a relatively larger reallocation from pillar one than, pillar two, than the higher income economies. So turning to pillar two, which is shown in the right hand panel, you can see that there will be a in significant increase in corporate income taxes across high, middle, and low income countries. As I already mentioned, pillar two would also reduce incentives for multinational firms to shift profits to low tax jurisdiction. And that is because it, it reduces the tax rate difference within jurisdictions as it sets a floor for the tax rate. And that this would also bring additional revenue gains in, in addition to the direct gains from the minimum tax. So having said this, I will now hand over to Stefan who will describe in detail how we obtained our estimates. Thank you, Osa, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all. 
so I, I will present in more details our revenue estimates for pillar one and pillar two. And so that, that will uh, ex explain the, the numbers that uh, OSA has just presented at a high level. Uh, so let me start with pillar one. Uh, so what pillar one does is primarily to reallocate to market jurisdictions the right to tax a percentage of the residual profit of uh, multinationals. And so you can see this on this stylized illustration. Uh, so the bar as a whole represents the total profit of a multinational group up to a certain profitability threshold. Um, so for example, 10% on uh, profit before tax to turnover, it is routine profit. So that's the blue part uh, or non-residual profit. And this profit would not be affected by uh, pillar one. And then above the threshold, you have residual profit. And a fraction of this residual profit would be reallocated to market jurisdiction. So market jurisdictions is where the consumers are located, or in some cases for, for digital services where the users are located. And for example, 20% uh, of, of residual profit could be reallocated, but, but this number, the, the reallocation fraction and the residual profit threshold have to be defined by the inclusive framework at a later stage. And so we've presented results for a range of options throughout the report. And, uh, and the results I will present in, in one second uh, focus on a 10% or 20% profitability threshold and illustratively a 20% reallocation percentage. Um, so this is what uh, amount A of pillar one would do. And as Sosa was saying, it involves a substantial reallocation of taxing rights. I, I will show you in one second that uh, the taxing rights on about $100 billion of profit could be reallocated. Uh, but as you know, there are three parts in, in pillar one. There's amount A that I was describing, amount B, and then a tax certainty component. And so we've just to clarify, we've just modeled amount A, and this is because of data limitations, because the two other components are more difficult to, to model with the available data. Uh, but And overall, we think that the impact on global tax revenues of amount B and the tax certainty component would be smaller than the impact of amount A. They, they could still matter at the level of individual jurisdictions. And in particular, amount B could bring revenues to jurisdictions that have low administrative capacity. But at the global level, uh, it's amount A that would be the most significant. So if we move to the next slide, uh, coming back to amount A, uh, what, what you can see on this slide is an estimate of the amount of residual profit that could be reallocated at the global level to the market jurisdictions. And this is for different values of the residual profit threshold. So you can see this on the, on the x-axis. You have 8%, 10%, 15%, 20%, 25%. 25%. And then also for different values of the reallocation percentage. So you have 10%, 20%, and 30%. That's the different colors of the bars. Uh, so it shows with, with different parameters uh, what kind of results you could get. And so to take just one example, the one I was mentioning earlier, if you take a 10% profitability threshold and a 20% reallocation percentage, so that's the, the gray bar that has a red arrow pointing to it, then um, you would have uh, about $100 billion of uh, residual profits that would be reallocated to market jurisdictions. Of course, if you take different parameters, as you can see on the figure, you, you get different estimates. And so by, by showing these different possibilities, we're trying to inform the future decisions by the inclusive framework. A, a quick word on how we compute these numbers. So we use a very extensive data set of consolidated financial accounts of MEs. We use the Orbis database as a starting point, and then we complemented it with WorldScope and with other sources. Uh, and we've made a lot of checks to ensure that we have a very good coverage of uh, multinational groups and especially large multinational groups in the data. So if we move to the next slide to see the results, uh, I'm uh, jumping over a lot of work to assess where this residual profit is currently located and where it would be reallocated. Uh, and on this, we use a range of data sources as, as Sebastian will ex explain later in the presentation. And you can find the full methodology on how we do this in, in the report. Uh, it's, it's a bit too long to uh, explain in full detail now. Um, so uh, the results, uh, as David was saying earlier, we present by uh, groups of jurisdictions. So you can see on the left-hand side, results presented by uh, income groups, so high income, middle income, low income, and investment hubs. So it's World Bank uh, classification, and the investment hubs, it's uh, jurisdictions that have FDI to GDP ratio over 150%. And these are jurisdictions that also often have relatively low effective tax rates. 
And on the right hand side, you have uh, results by um, groups in terms of statutory corporate tax rate. So statutory rate between zero and 10 percent, 10 to 20, 20 to 30 and above 30. Uh, all results are presented in, uh, as a share of current CIT revenues and all results are presented as ranges to reflect the uncertainties around the data. And there are two sets of results in, in this slide, um, either uh, assuming a 10% residual profit threshold or a 20% residual profit threshold. So that 10% is the dark blue and 20% is the light blue. So if we look at the global effect first, so the, the one that you see at the top of both panels, which, which are the same, uh, you can see, as Osa was saying earlier, that uh, you would have uh, a, a revenue gain at the global level, but uh, relatively modest, so less than 1% of global CIT revenues. And this is because even if the um, pillar one does not change the global tax base because it is a reallocation, the tax base is reallocated to jurisdictions where the tax rate is on average higher than uh, where residual profit is currently located. So even if the tax base doesn't change, you apply a slightly higher rate uh, on average. And so there's uh, a tax revenue gain at the global level. Then if we look at the results for the main uh, groups uh, by income level, you can see gains for high income, middle income, and low income jurisdictions uh, for the both residual profit thresholds considered. And the gains tend to be larger for low income jurisdictions. And this is because there's relatively little residual profit that is currently located in low income jurisdictions. So they have relatively little to lose in the reallocation. And uh, so they, they tend to gain relatively more than the higher income ones. Uh, and then the investment hubs, as you can see, they tend to lose tax revenue. Uh, how much they actually lose is uh, quite difficult to assess. And so as you can see, the uncertainty range is relatively wide. And that's because it depends a lot on how residual profit is currently taxed in investment hubs, which is uh, difficult to assess with uh, great precision with the available data. So if you look at the le oh, sorry at the right hand side, you see a consistent picture uh, in the sense that jurisdictions with relatively low tax rates, so between zero and ten or ten and twenty, they tend to lose revenues, while jurisdictions with higher rates tend to gain. And uh, th and jurisdictions with rates between zero and ten lose relatively little, and that's because uh, a number of them have very low effective tax rates, or often uh, no uh, corporate tax rate, zero tax rate, uh, in which case they can't really lose revenue. So that's why they are losing less than the, the group that is between 10 and 20. So that's the overall picture on pillar one. If we move to the next slide, we can uh, turn to pillar two. Uh, so pillar two is essentially a, a minimum tax. So it's a set of rules that would give jurisdictions the right to tax back profit when it is currently taxed below the minimum rate. And it essentially works as a top up on existing taxes. So the, it's a top up to bring the effective tax rate up to the level of the minimum tax rate. And, and this minimum tax rate uh, will have to be decided by the inclusive framework at a later stage. Uh, and so as we did for pillar one, we've been exploring a number of options uh, in the report about the rate. And in this presentation, I will focus illustratively on a 12.5% rate. Uh, but in the report, you have results for uh, a wide range of possible uh, other rates. So another assumption is that this rate would apply jurisdiction by jurisdiction. So what, what is called jurisdictional blending, as opposed, for example, to global blending. And uh, we have also modeled the implications of potential substance-based carve-out to pillar two. And so in this presentation, the assumption is that there would be a 10% carve out on expenses on payroll and depreciation of, of tangible assets. So it means that 10% of payroll and depreciation would be excluded from the base to which Pillar 2 applies. Uh, in the report, we've modeled more options. Uh, and, and again, this is purely for illustrative purposes and it, it does not prejudge uh, future decisions by the inclusive framework. And finally, we've also assumed that, uh, as, as Osa was saying, that the US guilty regime would coexist with Pillar 2, which means that the US MNEs would remain subject to guilty and not be subject to the new Pillar 2 rules. Uh, and again, this is something illustrative that will have to be decided by the, by the inclusive framework at a later stage. So if we move to the next slide, um, this is describing the scenarios that we've been modeling on, uh, on Pillar 2. Because on pillar two, we think that behavioral reactions may be more important than for pillar one. 
And so this is why we have tried to model some reactions by MNEs and by governments. And of course, reactions are always difficult to anticipate and they can be complex. So this should be seen as stylized scenarios and uh, nothing more than that. Uh, so going through these scenarios, the first one, uh, which is our starting point, is a static scenario. Uh, so it's basically, basically assuming no reaction by MNEs and governments. Uh, and it also ignores the existence of pillar one uh, in, in the sense that pillar two is modeled in isolation in, in this scenario. Then in the second scenario, we refine this by taking into, a fact that the, into account the fact that the two pillars uh, and the, their effects can interact with each other, uh, which means that uh, the, the implementation of pillar one can have an effect on the, the pillar two estimates. And so we take this into account in this second scenario. But as, as you will see in the next slide, it doesn't make a, a big difference. Then on the third scenario, we try to take into account the reaction of multinationals and the main reaction that we anticipate is that multinationals would reduce their profit shifting intensity. And this is because pillar two would reduce tax rate differentials between jurisdictions. And we know from a lot of past studies that tax rate differentials are a key driver of profit shifting between jurisdictions. So of course, we don't think that profit shifting would be completely eliminated, uh, but we think it could be reduced significantly. And, uh, and we've done a lot of work to model the current profit shifting behavior and here, the, the, I won't go through this in detail, but our results are quite consistent with the academic literature. And then uh, also some work to model the potential impact of pillar two on this profit shifting. Uh, and then this as well, you can find in, the, in full detail in, in the report. Then there's another potential reaction of MNEs that we don't uh, take into account in, in this section is the potential change in their real investment behavior, which could ultimately affect tax revenues as well. So this is not something that we've tried to incorporate here, but it is something that Tibor will be discussing in, uh, in a few moments. So that is scenario three. Uh, and then in scenario four, we also try to take into account the reactions by governments. So here, it, it is more uncertain that the, the reaction of multinationals uh, but one potential reaction is that some low tax jurisdictions, so jurisdictions where the, the effective tax rate is currently below the minimum rate, may increase their effective tax rate up to the level of the minimum rate. And, and uh, the idea of this reaction would be that it may not change the overall tax burden of MNEs because they would have to pay the minimum rate somewhere anyway, but it would allow these jurisdictions increasing their rate to collect more taxes. And so that, that's the general idea behind this scenario. But in practice, it's more complicated than what I just said, because, uh, for instance, if there's a substance-based carve-out, if guilty coexists with pillar two, it may not be also straightforward to increase your effective tax rate without increasing the tax burden for at least some MNEs. So it may, and it may also be difficult for jurisdictions that don't have a CIT system to introduce one CIT system from scratch. So at the end of the day, um, it, it's very difficult at this stage to anticipate uh, how many and if uh, jurisdictions would increase their effective tax rate. And so we've been assuming in this scenario that some jurisdictions would increase their tax rate, but not all low tax jurisdictions. Another thing that we've uh, not tried to capture in these scenarios is the reaction, potential reactions by high tax governments. Uh, whether they may increase, reduce their effective tax rates, uh, because it, it's not as obvious what they would do as, uh, as discussed also in, in the report. So turning to the results uh, on the next slide. The, so what you can see in this figure is the global revenue gained from pillar two in the four scenarios that I just described. And for each scenario, you have a low estimate and a high estimate. And this is as earlier to reflect the uncertainty around the data. And one specific thing where there is uncertainty here is what is materialized in the, the dashed green bars. So it's the, about the pockets of low tax profit in high tax jurisdictions. Uh, and so to explain this a bit more, what happens in the low estimates, so on the, the bars on the left, is that uh, we only focus on low tax profit in generally low tax jurisdictions. So jurisdictions where the average effective tax rate is below the minimum rate. But however, we know that even in generally high tax jurisdictions, there may be pockets of low tax profit. For instance, if you have uh, certain tax incentives that bring the effective tax rates to a relatively low level, 
And this is actually very difficult to measure with precision with the data that we have. So we have included, um, we have taken a conservative approach in the low estimate and uh, ignored these potential gains. And then we have included uh, an estimate of the potential gains associated to these pockets in the high estimates. And uh, that, that's what you can see with the, the dashed uh, green uh, bars. So if we go through the different scenarios, uh, and if we start from scenario one on the left, uh, what, what you can see first is that uh, between scenario one and scenario two, the results are almost identical. Uh, and, and it means that uh, the interaction with uh, pillar one has very little effect on the results because that, that's, uh, that's what we take into account when we move to scenario two. So it doesn't change the, the results much. Then when we move to scenario three, what changes is that we take into account the reduced profit shifting by MNEs. So this is adding this red or brown uh, part of the bar uh, in, uh, that appears in scenario three. And so as you can see, it increases the, the revenue gains at the global level. And that's because uh, there's profit that is no longer shifted to low tax jurisdictions. And so it, it, it is taxed at a higher rate than when it, where it was uh, shifted. And then finally in scenario four, what happens is that some low tax jurisdictions increase their ETR. And this does not really change the global revenue gains. So as you can see, the global uh, total is almost the same as in scenario three, but it changes who collects these gains. And uh, in particular, the jurisdictions increasing their ETR collect the part that corresponds to the yellow part of the bar. So that they, they get a, a part of the global gain, uh, but uh, just uh, a part of it. So now if we move to the, the next slide, the, the revenue gains by jurisdiction groups. Um, so that, that's the same as for pillar one. So we're presenting results uh, for high income, middle income, low income jurisdictions and investment hubs. And uh, there's quite a lot of information on, on, on this slide because you have the four scenarios and these four groups. But uh, what stands out is that for the first three groups, so for the high income, middle income and low income, you have significant revenue gains in all four scenarios and the gains tend to be higher in scenarios three and four, thanks to the reduction in, uh, in profit shifting. And uh, the high income jurisdictions tend to gain slightly more than the middle and low income ones. And that's because they have more m &E headquarters than the, the low income jurisdictions. Uh, so that's the, the opposite picture than the, what we had on, on pillar one. Uh, and then the group for which there's most uncertainty is the investment hubs. And uh, that's because it's a group that's more heterogeneous than the other groups. And also because the results vary across the different scenarios. So as you can see, the investment hubs tend to gain in scenarios one and two. Then in scenario three, they tend to gain less than in scenarios one and two. And this is because some investment hubs receive shifted profits at the moment. So if you reduce profit shifting, they would receive less profit and collect less revenues. And then in scenario four, they gain more again than, uh, than in scenario three. And this is because uh, a number of investment hubs increase their effective tax rate in this scenario. So then they collect a greater share of the total uh, revenues. And this reduces a bit the gains for the, the other groups in, uh, in the high, middle and low income uh, groups. But as you can see, the difference with scenario three is not so large. So that's it for the for the revenue section. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a quick overview. And as I said earlier, it's just a subset of results and, and you can find results with many uh, different assumptions and, and parameters in, in the report. Uh, so with this, I, I hand over to Tibor Hanapi, who will uh, present you the, um, the investment effect. Yeah, thanks, Stefan. Uh, welcome, everybody. So with this, move, we move to the effects of the proposals on investment and economic activity. And on this slide, we've um, summarized the main findings on this part of the report in um, three um, bullet points in bold. So uh, first we find that both pillars would lead to a relatively small increase in M&E investment costs. And this would in turn uh, have a negative effect on global investment, which um, we would estimate based on our analysis to be less than 0.1% of GDP. And this is because the, propos the proposals would mostly affect highly profitable M&Es whose, whose investment is uh, less sensitive to taxes. In addition, the effect could be lower if m and &E groups uh, relocate investment within their group in response to cost increases in a given jurisdiction. On this part of the, um, the analysis, the direct um, impact on investment and economic activity, my colleagues Anna Sinta and Valentin will 
say a bit more in the subsequent slides. Second, um, we also looked at indirect effects. And here we find that pillar one and pillar two could support global investment and growth through indirect channels that are significant, but are more difficult to, to quantify. So here we really wanted to be more comprehensive to try to also address these points. And we find that uh, this would lead, for instance, to an increased relevance of non-tax factors, like for instance, educational levels, infrastructure, wage costs, business environment, and so forth, due to lower tax rate differentials across jurisdictions. And this could then also lead to an improvement in um, efficiency of uh, global capital allocation. In addition, we also find that uh, tax certainty would be increased compared to the counterfactual situation where there would be um, an array of uh, unilateral measures that basically lead to a more incoherent tax system. And also, um, it would uh, reduce the need to raise revenues through other potentially more distortive tax measures, like, for instance, digital service taxes. And of course, all of these effects in the consensus case need to be compared to the proper counterfactual. And um, here we need to take into account what would happen in a, in a, in a case where no mutual or multilateral agreement would be reached. And here we find that it would be likely that there would be a proliferation of unilateral tax measures, like for instance, digital service taxes. And this would then also very likely lead to a tax and trade dispute. And uh, based on our modeling, um, this could lead to a reduction in global GDP by more than 1% in the worst case scenario, as I will um, describe a bit later. Now I'm, I pass on to my colleague Anna Sinter to say a bit more about the, the investment cost. Thank you, Tibor. So as Tibor has just mentioned, one of the main channels through which Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 might affect investment decisions is through the increase in investment costs for those MNEs affected. So in this particular analysis, we set up a framework to estimate the direct effects of the proposals on the effective tax rates faced by MNEs. And to do so, we use a well-known framework in the literature, that of Deborah and Griffith, which considers the impact of taxation on a hypothetical investment that's comparable across jurisdictions. But in order to evaluate the reforms, we adapt it in two ways. Uh, one, to incorporate the fact that MNEs can use their organizational structure to shift profits. And two, to, in to incorporate an stylized modeling of the Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 proposals. So the analysis we present here covers over 70 jurisdictions, and it builds an stylized MNE structure that we calibrate empirically to match the location of MNEs, profits, and assets, using the same data sources that underpin um, the revenue estimate that uh, Sebastian uh, would uh, subsequently talk about. And as in the revenue analysis, there are a number of illustrative assumptions that we have made regarding the policy parameters of the proposals, which uh, do not prejudice um, the decisions to be taken by the members of the inclusive framework. So in order to estimate the effect of pillar one and pillar two on m and investment costs, ultimately what we do is compare the effective average and marginal tax rates that m and faces on their investments pre and post tax reform. And the graph in the right hand side of your screen uh, shows the estimated change in the global GDP weighted effective marginal tax rates from the interaction, like resulting from the, from the introduction of pillar one and pillar two. And as in the revenue analysis is broken down by income groups. So if we focus on the result for all jurisdictions, so that would be the right uh, bar on the graph, we estimate pillar one and pillar two would cost the global GDP weighted EMTR to increase by one percentage point with the EATR increasing by around 0.3 percentage points. So overall, this suggests rather modest effects of pillar one and pillar two on MNE's investment costs with the effects being larger as can be seen from the graph uh, for pillar two than, than for pillar one. So this analysis is contained in a, in a working paper that we invite you to consult if you would like further information on the methodology and results. So how you presenting the, our estimates on how the proposals might directly affect MNE's effective tax rates I will now hand over to my colleague Valentin Mio to provide some more evidence on the tax sensitivity of a mini investment. Thanks, Anna Sinta. So uh, I'm going to talk about another piece of analysis that we have been conducting to investigate what could be the effect of this slight increase in effective tax rates on MA investment. So the starting point for this analysis is the result from past literature that corporate taxation tends to have a negative effect on investment by firms. So if the reforms lead to a small increase in effective tax rates, there is a risk that this will affect multinational investment downwards. 
However, what the literature also shows is that the sensitivity of firm investment to corporate taxes tends to vary across firms. So this is what we have tried to investigate, uh, relying on a firm level panel based on Orbis data and covering uh, 17 different OECD countries. And what we find is that the firm sensitivity to corporate tax indeed depends on m and &E groups, and more precisely, that it depends on the profitability rate of the m and &E group considered. So this is what you see in the graph on the right-hand side of the slide. So what we see is that entities belonging to m and &E groups with either negative profitability or very high profitability rates, so it's typically above 10%, uh, tend to react less to an increase in effective tax rates than entities belonging to groups with intermediate profitability rates. So overall, this is interesting because this suggests that uh, MEs that are more profitable, which are also more likely to be impacted by the reforms, uh, might be less sensitive to taxes in their investment behavior than the typical ME. Uh, and behind this uh, result, there might be various channels which may all contribute to explain the result. Uh, one channel may be that uh, more profitable groups generally have more liquidity available than less profitable groups, and this is likely to make them less sensitive to a potential increase in, in taxation. Uh, another potential channel is that highly profitable firms benefit from market power, and in this case, tax incidents uh, may fall more on monopoly rents than on normal return to capital, which would imply a smaller impact on investment decisions. And, uh, and then finally, more profitable firms may also have more tax planning incentives than other groups, which would also make them uh, less sensitive uh, to local taxation. So all these channels are, are discussed in more detail in, in the report and also in a specific working paper, which you, you can find online. online. Um, so, so now I will give the floor back to Tibor to, to continue talking on the potential effects uh, of the reform on investment. Thank you, Valentina and uh, Anna Sinter. Yeah, so now we've heard a lot about the direct effects uh, of the proposals on investment and economic uh, activity operating through investment costs and the tax sensitivity of MEs. But this is not the only piece of work that we've done in this area. We've also looked at indirect effects, um, which uh, are much harder to quantify, but uh, we find them to be also potentially um, relevant to the results um, on investment and economic activity. Um, we did this analysis based on, uh, on literature review mostly, and in particular we find that uh, these indirect effects could partly or even fully offset uh, the effect of cost increases. Of course, this result is um, jurisdiction um, depends on the jurisdiction, jurisdictional context as well as on policy responses by, by government. So if you now think about um, the different points here listed on this slide, uh, fiscal space, we've heard from, from Stefan that uh, most jurisdictions will benefit from an increase in revenue. This would support public finances and that uh, these, these finances could also potentially be used to improve the investment climate. And this could also um, be especially important for developing countries um, uh, in the, uh, with their desire to mobilize more domestic resources. In a similar direction, we would expect um, tax competition to become less intense between jurisdictions. And this would again support um, public finances over the long term uh, in developed as well as developing countries. Another important area are um, tax incentives. And here, of course, there could be um, many policy areas where tax incentives are used. We're focusing here on two specific areas, innovation and development. And uh, some of the um, arguments can be applied for both, for both points. But let me start with innovation and here we find that there could be a concern about the effectiveness of tax incentives and that they could be affected especially by the minimum tax um, um, provisions under Pillar 2. However, we find that this would be um, less likely to be the case given that there would be or there could be a substance-based carve-out um, on payroll, for instance, and uh, tangible assets. And uh, in addition, we also find that um, there would be sufficient policy space available for jurisdictions after implementation um, to reach the desired level of innovation um, using other, other policy tools. And this may require that the policy mixes could be, could, might have to be adapted. Um, yeah, and that's uh, the point here. It's, um, similarly also could be applied to the question for tax incentives for development. However, in the context of development, it's also again important to think about tax competition fiscal space. And here there's another important point that we wanted to highlight, which is that, um, also, the, the provisions under, under Pillar 2 could help to uh, 
strengthen the bargaining position of developing countries, specifically in situations where they would want to move away from costly, potentially inefficient tax incentives. Next, another very important point are compliance and administration costs. And here, of course, the new provisions um, are likely to increase the, fi uh, the filing requirements and thereby also lead to additional costs for MEs and governments. And these could also feed into um, uh, investment decisions by MEs. However, the extent to which this will be the case depends on the final design and also on the simplification measures that are included in the, in the, in the package. So these are particularly difficult to, to quantify. And uh, finally, we've also um, looked at firm competition. And here, there is an interesting point because uh, taxes are mostly, uh, the, the new um, provisions are mostly targeted to um, highly profitable, uh, large, and potentially um, profit-shifting MEs. And this could uh, imply that uh, the new provisions could also affect competition uh, dynamics with respect to other types of firms, uh, for instance, domestic firms or firms that engage less in um, profit shifting. And with this, uh, I'd like to see the next slide, please. Yeah, so what we basically then want to do in an overall assessment is to compare the consensus scenario to a suitable no consensus scenario. And this is what we're doing on this slide here. However, the first thing to note is that in this slide, we're only looking at the direct effects. So everything that I said about the indirect effects on the previous slide, is not included in the figures that um, make up this graph here. Here we're looking really only at, um, at the, um, the, the direct effect that operates through investment costs. So if you look at the left-hand side, you can see the results for the consensus scenario in terms of its impact on GDP, on global GDP in percent. And we find this to be to range between zero and uh, minus 0.1%, um, taking only the direct effects into account. Now, if you want to, if you want to compare this with a with a suitable um, counterfactual, we have to take into account that in the no consensus case, there will be a proliferation of unilateral measures, including digital service taxes, and this could lead to trade and tax disputes, um, or tariff retaliation, and counter retaliation, and all of these um, scenarios or these, uh, these these possible directions depend on um, uh, various parameters that are underlying these scenarios on the right-hand side of the, of the graph. For instance, whether there is proportional retaliation or more than proportional retaliation, the, um, the DST rates that are assumed and so forth. So if you look now at the two um, groups that we're distinguishing, you also see like in the middle bar that this is the case where we have a, a narrow group of countries implementing a DST. And here, um, the range of results is, is less spread out compared to the right-hand side. Um, although it is um, still more negative than the consensus case, um, even the worst case um, in the consensus scenario is um, still um, a better outcome than the, 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 the most positive one in the, in the case of the narrow DST implementation. Now, if we look at the, at the right-hand side of this figure, we see that the, the range of outcomes is much um, wider and also the, um, the overall negative effects are larger ranging up to minus 1% of global GDP or even more. So this is basically a good summary of our work on the investment effects and economic activity. And with this, I pass uh, on to my colleague, Sebastian. Thank you, Tibor. Um, so as you've heard in the previous uh, discussions, the economic impact assessment mobilizes a wide set of data sources. Uh, the first type of data that has been used uh, is firm level data mostly coming from uh, the RBS database, and it provides information on the financial accounts of multinationals. And this, uh, this data allows to answer a lot of questions, including, for instance, the level of residual profit under Pillar 1. The second type of data that has been used is aggregated data on the activity of multinationals. Uh, this includes, for instance, the new anonymized and aggregated country-by-country -country reporting data that has been released by the OECD in July. Um, and this data is helpful to get information on, uh, for instance, the location and of profit and economic activity of multinationals. The third type of data that has been mobilized relates to uh, tax rates and tax revenues at the jurisdiction level. It includes data on statutory tax rates, but also on forward-looking effective tax rates uh, or CIT revenues, most mainly derived from OECD corporate tax statistics. And it also uses other data sources, such as, again, the CBICR data, um, to obtain information on uh, backward-looking effective tax rates which can be particularly useful to identify the location 
uh, of low tax profit in the context of pillar two. And finally, the analysis uses maybe more familiar macroeconomic data at the jurisdiction level, such as GDP or GDP per capita, trade openness, uh, that, can, that are particularly helpful, um, for instance, to run extrapolations when hard data is actually missing or unavailable. So let me show you in particular in the next uh, slide, please, uh, the way that data, data has been combined to create what we've called matrices uh, to map the geography of the economic activity of multinational. So the example shown in this slide on the right is uh, corresponds to the matrix for profit, but the idea is the same for the three other matrices that uh, have been built for turnover, tangible assets, and payroll, four variables that uh, have been chosen uh, based on the needs of the impact assessment. So in practice, each matrix contains data across more than 200 jurisdictions of affiliate, which are the rows of the matrices, and broken down across more than 200 jurisdictions of ultimate parent, which are the columns of the matrices. And so for instance, if you look at the, the cell, which is at the intersection of the French column and the US row, it will contain here, the total profit of uh, French m &Es in the US. Each of the cells are then filled with a specific data source, uh, sources that have different coverage and different advantages and disadvantages. Some sources will be helpful to fill uh, columns of the matrices. This is the case of the C by CR data uh, in red here. Uh, the C by CR data provides a breakdown of economic activity across all rows, but only for a selection of jurisdictions of ultimate parent. Some other sources are helpful to fill rows of the matrices, and this is the case uh, with the Orbis data in green, uh, which provides data on the financial accounts of MNE affiliates uh, with good coverage in a selection of jurisdictions, meaning a selection of rows, uh, but across all uh, columns. And finally, in all four matrices, we use the method of uh, last resort uh, when no hard data was available. Um, this method is just uh, extrapolations using macroeconomic data which for the purpose of the current example was using FDI data to extrapolate profit. So as you can see, uh, multiple data sources, including the extrapolations can cover the same data points. And this can be extremely useful for the purpose of benchmarking sources uh, against each other and more broadly um, to assess the quality of the data. And that has, enabled, uh, that has enabled us to undertake extensive benchmarking as part of the preparation of the matrices uh, described in great detail in chapter four five and even more in the appendices of uh, chapter five that I highly recommend. Um, and, and, and also the assessment of the quality of the data was also informed uh, by the interactions of the secretariat with stakeholders that uh, Pierce is going to address next. Uh, thank you, Sebastian. Uh, so I will briefly speak now about the ways that we engage with countries and, and outside organizations uh, as we carried out this work. So uh, this is potentially one of the most you know, significant international tax reforms uh, ever contemplated. And so it's fair to say that this is probably the most extensive work that we have ever done um, in terms of informing countries of, of the potential impact of a set of uh, proposals uh, in real time. And so we, we did this so that all countries could understand what the measures meant for them and their own tax systems, their own tax revenues, and you know, particularly with reference to the, the many different moving parts and parameters uh, that, that are under discussion and are, are still under discussion. So the key way that we inform countries as, as part of the impact assessment was uh, through the circulation of uh, country-specific revenue estimation tools. Um, so that's based on the analysis that uh, Stefan and, and Sebastian have uh, just presented. So these tools were essentially uh, bespoke models, uh, one, you know, one per country, that we sent to our all inclusive framework member jurisdictions who asked for one. And what they allowed countries to do was to understand how various parameters of the proposals um, would impact tax revenues and, and revenue outcomes in, in their specific countries. So countries could change, for example, the, the tax rates in pillar two, the parameters in amount A, the scope, the nexus rules, et cetera, and understand how, how those changes would impact the outcomes for their specific countries. Um, so there's allowed countries to, uh, to essentially under, understand how the proposals would impact them. We extensively briefed uh, all of the major uh, OECD working groups and, and committees. Um, if you are familiar with the OECD, you understand there's a lot of these. Um, and, but this allowed us to, to really uh, get feedback from members in, over the course of the process about what they specifically wanted us to model, and also to make sure that all of these various groups uh, were, were working on the basis of the latest uh, analysis and the latest figures. Uh, we had a lot of uh, bilateral back and forth with uh, the various uh, member jurisdictions. 
Um, often this was you know, structured around understanding the, the results in a, in a tool for a given country um, so that they understand you know, which parts of the proposals were having different impacts and why they were seeing the numbers uh, that they were seeing. Uh, lastly, I'd just like to mention we had a lot of very useful uh, interactions with uh, international and regional organizations, with academics, with civil society groups, many of whom were, were carrying out their own analysis as part of the, um, of the proposals. And we definitely benefited a lot uh, from those engagements and, and we really appreciate them. And uh, with that, I'll pass back to Oza, who will I think discuss COVID-19 and uh, conclude. So thank you, Piers. I will just say a couple of words on the implication of the COVID-19 crisis for the analysis. It's difficult to assess the full impact of the crisis on the economy and on tax revenues of the proposals. And the reason for that is that the crisis is still ongoing. So the estimates that have been presented here today, they do not take into account the implications of the crisis since there's no data available on this yet. Having said that, the crisis is likely to reduce the expected revenue gains of both pillars, at least in the short term, since most firms' profit has been reduced due to the slowdown in economic activity as we're seeing now, perhaps with an exception of some digital intensive multinationals that have seen an increase. However, the longer term effect of the crisis on, on revenue estimate is uncertain as it depends on the shape of recovery and on structural changes that the, the crisis can, may cause. For instance, we have seen an intensification of digitalization and that can potentially increase the importance of automated dig digital service in Pillar 1. So all in all, accelerated digitalization, fiscal pressures that are likely to come from the COVID crisis and are growing dissatisfaction with tax avoidance are likely to lead to further unilateral tax measures in the, in the absence of a consensus-based solution. For, so uh, further pressing ahead with a solution is important. So I will stop here and hand over to David, who will moderate the Q&A session. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ossa. And uh, thank you to you all for sending through your questions. I'm conscious of the time that we're meant to only have four minutes. We might run just a few minutes over time to do our best to get through as many questions as possible. At this stage, I think we've received more than 20 questions. We won't be able to get to them all. If we can't answer your question in this live session, we will come back to you um, uh, through uh, email or, or via the chat. Uh, I'll try and address a couple of them quickly. Um, there was one question about whether or not the revenue estimates take into account uh, the banking and insurance sectors. Um, I should say that uh, they have been excluded for the purposes of Pillar 1, the amount A uh, estimations, uh, but have been included uh, in the context of Pillar 2. Uh, there was a question about um, Vice President Biden's proposal to double the US guilty rate, and the question was to what extent will that affect uh, the estimates in our impact assessment. Uh, firstly, in the impact assessment, we treat the guilty as coexisting with Pillar 2. Uh, we do not um, uh, undertake an independent modelling of the revenue impacts of guilty. We rely upon an ex ante assessment from the Joint Committee on Taxation uh, to produce those figures. Uh, obviously, if the guilty were to be, um, were to be amended, uh, that may well have an impact on the revenues collected under the guilty. Uh, but um, in broad terms, that would not have uh, an impact on the estimates that we produced uh, for other countries and for the rest of the globe. Uh, we see there's another question uh, in relation to the breakdown between ADS and CFB. Uh, and um, can I point you to uh, chapter two of the, the report, which details uh, the, the specifics around the breakdown between the two. Uh, but in broad terms, when we look at the residual profit between ADS and CFB, it's about uh, one fifth uh, to one quarter uh, ADS versus uh, four-fifths or three-quarters uh, for CFB. I should note, however, that as I mentioned earlier, and to a, the answer to a question that has been asked by someone else about the year of the data, it's typically 2016 and 2017 data that we've used. Uh, but that's significant in responding to this question about CFB and ADS, because uh, in some analysis that we've undertaken, just looking at the top 10 M&Es in ADS, uh, we have observed between 2016 and 2019 
there was a 30% increase in the residual profit of those 10 firms. So we would expect uh, that because of the point in time that we are estimating uh, back in 16, 17 data, uh, that we have perhaps underestimated the extent of ADS as it now stands. And I think that we would all have our own views about what the impact of the, the crisis, the COVID-19 crisis has had. And we would expect that residual profit from ADS firms may well be even larger as a result of that as well. Uh, there was another question in relation to investment hubs. Have any of them presented their own public estimates of the effects of the proposals on their country? Uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, they have not, but I am aware that um, the, the Netherlands has um, produced some estimates based upon uh, the information uh, that we have provided in the, on a bilateral basis through the revenue estimation tools. Uh, and they have provided that information in a letter to their parliament uh, and that has, uh, uh, that has been publicly uh, released. Um, there are a couple of questions around developing countries. I might try and address those. There's also a question that asks whether or not the report shows gross amounts of gains for high, middle and low income purposes. Uh, now, we've chosen not to do that because we think it would be misleading for a few reasons. Um, now, firstly, there are different numbers of jurisdictions within those jurisdiction groups. So looking at the total amount of revenues doesn't necessarily give you um, a, a clear idea of exactly what those gains are. And indeed, we think that it is relevant to think about the impact of uh, this revenue on uh, this additional revenue by reference to existing uh, current corporate income tax revenues is probably the most universal way of comparing across countries that are quite heterogeneous. Having said that, we have in the tools that we provided directly to countries, uh, they have uh, in those tools the ability to determine what the, the impact is in absolute terms, uh, and they have uh, been producing that. But because of the decision not to share jurisdiction-specific results, uh, we're not, not able to share that at that level. But certainly the countries have that information. In terms of developing countries, a couple of, quest a couple of people have asked the question, um, what does this all mean for developing countries? I think uh, trying to answer that as quickly as possible, I would say, firstly, on pillar one, um, it's a reallocation of taxing rights, uh, modest amounts of revenues globally, but we do see low income countries seeing uh, more of an allocation to them compared to what uh, where residual profit is currently located. So they benefit from that, but in modest terms. Um, we would see that in pillar two, that they will, they stand to benefit in particular uh, from the reduced profit shifting, the impact of uh, the introduction of the globe rules and its impact in reducing profit shifting. And in addition to that, we would see, and this is something we've had feedback from many low income jurisdictions, that they believe in relation to um, the, the issue of tax incentives, that a minimum tax would put them in a stronger bargaining position to resist having to provide uh, some tax incentives in order to attract investment. Uh, I should also say that amount B of pillar one that we have not sought to model because of the data limitations, uh, we also would expect that that will benefit a number of low, in low income jurisdictions, particularly those with administrative uh, limitations or administrative challenges, uh, low capacity, because they have reported to us that they find uh, implementing and enforcing uh, the transfer pricing rules to be quite difficult to do. Uh, in terms of some of the other questions, um, I won't be able to get through them all, but just to, to note that uh, there has been a question about um, DSTs and the nature of assumptions around their withdrawal. Uh, firstly, we assume that under the consensus-based solution, uh, they would be withdrawn and uh, those announced would not be implemented and no further countries would implement them. Um, but on the counterfactual of no consensus, uh, we, we model a range of different scenarios. Narrow implementation, uh, which is essentially um, the countries that are already the subject of Section 301 uh, investigations by the US Trade Representative, uh, through to a broader range of countries uh, implementing those measures. And full details of the various um, modelling uh, parameters and results for all of those uh, different um, uh, scenarios is presented in uh, chapter three, um, or sorry, chapter four uh, of, of the report. Uh, 
Um, I see a question about the efficiency of the global allocation of capital, and there being some suggestion that an IMF study suggests that the pillar one and two proposals would not achieve that. I'm not aware of the particular study you're referring to. Of course, we have uh, worked very collaboratively with the IMF through this, uh, this process. Um, the point that we would make on the efficiency of the allocation of capital is that to the extent that both pillar one and pillar two reduce tax rate differentials, uh, which they will do, they both have that effect or expected to have that effect, um, that will reduce profit shifting, it will reduce the incentives for multinationals to engage in that profit shifting. Now, it won't eliminate them completely, but it will significantly reduce those incentives. And that will reduce the influence of tax factors compared to the whole range of other factors that might drive the location uh, and investment decisions uh, that might otherwise be in play, such as those that Tibor referred to a little bit earlier. Um, uh, I think that's probably about all we've got time to, to answer uh, at this particular point. Uh, but those that are sent through questions will seek to respond to you uh, individually. If not, um, the slides and the video will be posted up on the OECD website. Uh, the slides have a contact email address. Um, please send your inquiries to that email address and we'll endeavour to do our best to get back to you as soon as possible. But uh, in closing, can I once again thank you all for your participation. We've had a very large turnout, a huge interest as evidenced by the, the sheer number of questions that we've received. Uh, we stand ready to uh, engage in ongoing dialogue with anyone that has any inquiries or, or further suggestions. Uh, and of course, as the project continues into mid-2021, we stand uh, ready to continue to provide Inclusive Framework members uh, with the support that they need in order to make the informed judgments that will be required as we move towards what will hopefully be uh, the attainment of a consensus-based solution. So thank you very much for your participation. Uh, and uh, in these difficult times, we uh, ask you all, do your best to say, stay safe and um, if, uh, you have time to be thinking about tax and economic impact assessment matters, uh, then don't hesitate to be in touch with us and we're happy to follow up on your questions. Thanks very much and stay safe.